Okay, my wonderful students, let's uh, begin lecture. We have a special announcement this morning. Don't forget our final exam schedule. Uh, we'll be in this room at 1 o'clock on Saturday, December 10th. Uh, we have a special uh, announcement from the Veterans Academic Resource Center. Um, and then we're going to talk about electrodynamics and stuff a little bit later. Uh, first, let's uh, give the floor to JP. JP. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Now? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm JP. I'm actually with the Student Veterans of America. And we also, we partnered with the VARC, which is the Veterans Academic Resource Center. On campus, that is the center where all the veterans go to process their education benefits, or just anywhere they want to chill, hang out, anything like that. So a new thing we did this year was we started the Veterans Pantry. If you guys are familiar with Night Pantry, it's something where students can donate food in, and then it gets distributed out to veterans in need. So we're just trying it out this year, and so far we've had a really good turnout. People have been donating a lot of food, so this is something we're looking to, to keep going every year and every year. So your professor showed you a slide here. This is just something, on the next slide you'll see the list of kind of things that we're going to take. Uh, we're looking at more, uh, you know, first aid items, non-perishable items, uh, toiletries, that kind of stuff that we can continue to keep in storage and then continue passing out. So today we'll, well actually on next Today's the announcement. Yeah, next Tuesday announcement. we'll pick it up. So next Tuesday we're going to be here and we're going to pick it up as like a big truck or something. So if you guys could donate anything that you can. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. It is going out for a good cause. Here's the list. Uh, okay, so here's the list up here. Uh, this is also uploaded in web courses, I believe, so if you don't want to just take notes down or anything, it is going to be there for you guys later. So like I said, we'd really appreciate it. It is going out for a good cause if you guys want to donate. Uh, other than that, thank Maybe, you. Do you want to say anything? I'm good. All right. Okay, thanks. Thank Hold you. on a second. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to be donating as well, and uh, hopefully you guys will bring, but I'm not going to be donating ramen noodles. That's on the list, but I don't know. I'll probably get something else, but if you want to bring ramen noodles, that's fine. Uh, I'll be donating, and uh, we'll just get just hopefully a ton of stuff, and just be generous, and, uh, and things will be good. Now, uh, one other thing that uh, JP did not mention, but which I will mention, and that is uh, there is no extra credit for doing this. I know sometimes faculty will give you a task like this or similar to this and give you extra credit on your grade. Uh, that is not the case here. So uh, no one is required, and it is strictly from the generosity of your heart. Uh, it will not affect your grade, either plus or minus. Um, Okay. Uh, question. Go ahead. Yeah, bring it to class. And then we'll have a couple husky guys come around. And, I don't know. We'll figure out some method to collect it. Maybe out in the hall or something as you come in. I'll bring some trash bags that we can just pile yeah. up in. Okay. So we'll, we'll uh, you know, hopefully we'll need a big semi down on the street level to load all this. We'll have so much stuff. But however much we have, uh, we'll collect it next Tuesday. And I'll put notes up on web courses to remind you and stuff like that. So. All right, thanks, fellas. Good. Right, thanks, Dr. Pete. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's keep. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, so here's the food items, uh, and this list will be up in web courses for you. I have a little PDF, basically the same list. Um, Take an eyeball of this. This is the periodic table of elements. Most of you have seen it from time to time in a science book, usually in the front or maybe in the back or also in the middle pages. Uh, it's a big table. And it is our primary target. It's like the top of the mountain for us. If you think about this course... As walking up a mountain, this is the top, figuring out the periodic table. And we're starting to get uh, all the concepts in place 
that we need to understand this periodic table of elements. Matter of fact, we've all, already done some observations. Hydrogen up here in the upper left. We looked at the spectrum of that with a diffraction grating on the second day of lecture. Helium all the way over here in the upper right. And we also took a look at neon right below helium. And this, the position of each of these elements on this table has physical meaning. And we're going to start getting down to the bottom of that or to the beginnings of that physical meaning uh, in today's lecture. Last time we talked about interference uh, as the most important concept. Uh, an example of that was beats. Uh, and we worked through this example with, uh, you know, a hypothetical, kind of a chalkboard exercise, more than an observation. Uh, a wave system with, which has a speed of propagation. Can you uh, dim this down a little bit? I'm a little too hot on the mic. Left. Yeah, go down. All right. Let's try that. All right, that's better. Um, yeah, I said, let's use a uh, speed of 80 meters per second just to have a round number. And I did a couple other frequency and wavelength uh, settings. And I produced a realistic picture uh, of a beats signal. So the, the top signal is at a certain frequency, frequency F1. The second signal in the middle here if you're looking in color, this one in red, uh, that is a, another signal, slightly different frequency. And when you listen to both of them together, remember, for interference, you have to have two separate sources or an extended source in order to see interference of different wavefronts. And so when you listen to those two sources at the same time, this big thick line on the bottom is the signal that you hear. And it's the sum of the first two. Now you can do it in a spreadsheet if you take a notion to doing that. But if you just want to look at it, yep, that's what it looks like. And I mentioned last time that there was uh, a loud high amplitude uh, region of the signal on the far left and on the far right. And then kind of in the middle, um, as if there was a trough and a, and a peak meeting in the middle of the ocean, flat water, that's right here in the middle. And if this was a sound wave, uh, that would be where it's faint. And we did listen to beats with the tuning fork demonstration. The calculation of the beat frequency, 12.8, and the beat wavelength, 6.25 meters, uh, is something that we that I showed you, I talked about, here's how it works out. You go ahead and make a note of this. The beat frequency is simply the difference of the two input frequencies. So you have one speaker operating at frequency one, you have another speaker operating at frequency two, and you're sitting in the room, and you listen to one and two at the same time, and you, you perceive this beat frequency. All right, and simply the biggest minus the smaller. They have to be pretty close together, though. All right. Uh, otherwise, you won't really notice the beats. And it had kind of that creepy sounding, uh, uh, you know, that, that sound that was kind of spooky sounding. The wavelength is simply V over frequency. Once you get the beat frequency, 12.8 hertz, then you put that in the wave equation for this hypothetical uh, wave, 80 miles, 80 meters per second for the speed of propagation, V, and then 12.8 hertz in the denominator. Now that hertz, don't forget, if you write that down carefully, there's hertzes on the bottom in the denominator. And there's per seconds in the speed on top. They cancel. So you're Resulting unit is down here uh, at, the, at the bottom here, meters. And the answer is 6.25 meters. Now, um, as a side note, 
I'll just remind you that the frequency of those tuning forks was pretty high. It was a musical tone. Do you know what? Did that? I think it's, I think it's C. Okay. Darianne is highly musical. Uh, she's a trained musician, and she said it was about a C, which it's possible. I, I'm not really up on all the musical concepts. Uh, but the beat frequency was much lower than that. The beat was not, it wasn't even a bass note. I mean, you could hear the variation, but it was way um, slower than even the deepest bass note. So uh, just a side note for that. And let's go and talk some more about another demonstration. We did the, the slinky, the coil spring up here in the front. Uh, and Darianne and uh, one of the students, uh, who was it? Do you remember? Uh, who came up? At, okay, Kristen. Uh, Kristen came up and helped us. And the distance was mm, about three meters between, dis, between Kristen and Darianne. And that was enough distance at the lowest frequency to get a standing wave, but only a bump oscillating between a bump and a dip. You didn't get one bump and one dip at the same time. And that's the fundamental. Half the wavelength is three meters, so the full wavelength, lambda one, of the fundamental is six meters. Approximately. I mean, we could have taken a tape measure out and measured it, and that would have been good. Uh, the frequency would just then be uh, the speed of propagation uh, divided by that lambda one whatever it is. Now, the first excited state, Kristen and Darian also got, and that was a full wiggle. And if you'll recall, it took Darian a second to get to the right frequency, because if you're not at the right frequency, those signals from Darian bounce off uh, Kristen and come back at Darian. They're not, organ they're not at the right frequency. They're not coming at the right time to form a standing wave. But at a certain frequency, yeah. Um, and in, if you do it at the correct frequency, the lambda will be exactly three, and you'll get one full wiggle. And that means that the uh, frequency V over lambda two is V over half the fundamental wavelength. Therefore, you get a two in the numerator, two V over lambda one, and that's the same as two times F one. That's why we call it the second harmonic vocabulary term there. Now the second excited state, that is the one where we had two bumps and a dip oscillating with Katrina, two dips and a bump in the middle. Okay, And they were oscillating back and forth between those states. And that would be called the third harmonic. And here's the, here's the pattern. If F1 is the frequency of the fundamental mode of the string or the you know the guitar string or violin string or whatever it is then the nth harmonic is has a frequency n so second harmonic is two times f1 third harmonic is three times f1 fourth harmonic is four times f1 all right, now, um, here's another uh, diagram. I s swiped this from the internets. A uh, really nice website up at Georgia State, hyperphysics, they call it. You can also see diagrams of this type on page 130. Um, this is a kind of a strobe diagram, strobish, strobishly styled diagram of the fundamental. So the distance L between the two endpoints, Darian and Kristen, is half the wavelength, all right? And that's the fundamental. Here's a stack from the same website of the fundamental on top, and then the first harmonic, excuse me, the, fir the fundamental is called the first harmonic, and then the next one down is called the second harmonic. And hey, you guys, this number n up here, 
stands for the number of the harmonic. So first harmonic is also known as the fundamental. Second harmonic is here, uh, and its frequency is two times the fundamental. And then the, the formula, the frequency of the nth harmonic is n times the frequency of the fundamental. It just keeps going. Here's a set of vocabulary terms. And you can jot these down next to your sketch. And this goes all the way down to the sixth harmonic, which, I, you know, I've gotten the fourth harmonic on that slinky. It's kind of tricky to do. you got to really, it, it really starts to get tough after the second. Um, another way to describe these, and this is how uh, a nuclear physicist or an, an atomic physicist would describe it, the fundamental, uh, he might, an, an acoustic or an electrical engineer might refer to it as harmonics. A physicist might refer to it as ground state, first excited state, second excited state, and on down. Now, the, that terminology on the far right, ground state, first excited state, second excited state, and so on, that is also a countable set of vocabulary terms. And it is related to how we describe an atom. And it's especially important for uh, understanding why atoms bind together in the patterns that they do to form molecules like H2O. Another thing I want to bring up to you, and not in terms of atoms and stuff and molecules, but in terms of musical instruments. When you strum a string on the guitar, assuming it's, it's tuned, if it's been tuned, you know, you, you strum one of the strings, you're going to get most of your sound from the fundamental. That is why the guitar has a very specific um, length, very, and then you have a very specific string, so many grams per centimeter, and very specific tension. On the, you know, you got to adjust the tension. When you're tuning a guitar, we'll bring someone in to do it. Uh, raise your hand if you have a guitar in class. Okay, we might get one of you guys to bring your guitar in. Uh, who has an acoustic guitar? Okay, who has an electric? Anybody? You guys? Good. All right, we might be bringing you guys in or at, volunteering you guys. Now, here's what I want you to, to understand. When you strum a guitar or a violin string, or a cello, or the 88-string guitar, known as a piano, or any other stringed instrument, you're going to get, mo you're going to get most of your sound energy out of the, harmo of the uh, fundamental, the first harmonic. But you're going to get second, third, and other harmonics, or overtones. All right? And the, the, the mixture, or the recipe that goes into how you um, add or how your instrument adds the higher harmonics to the fundamental, that is what gives you the distinctive sound of your instrument. A guitar playing a G is different from um, a cello playing a G, and that's different from a piano playing a G because they're different kinds of strings. Uh, and they have different mixtures of the overtones, the second, third, and on up. Okay, and you can um, sit your guitar in front of a micro, a good microphone, and then analyze it, and you'll be able to see the different overtones, how how strong they are. You know, so you might get a lot of the uh, fundamental and a lot of the third harmonic, and not much of the second harmonic. All right, and that'll give a little bit of edge to your note. Don't seem hard. If you don't get anything other than the fundamental, it sounds like you're a robot buzzing out a pure tone, which is all right if that's what you want. But guitars and violins and all that kind of pianos, uh, they all put out a mixture of the harmonic, so and that's what makes them really cool sounding. All right. Um, now, I promised you that we would uh, go over this object which I know nobody, everybody in here is a nice boy and girl. They never get in trouble with the cops. Uh, but 
it does happen. Let me transfer over to the um, uh, the regular computer and let's take a look at something in YouTube that computer. Right, go ahead and play. Now this is just some guy that loves trains. He's up in Amsterdam, New York, up north of New York City. Now listen to the train's horn. Did you hear that? Go back. Stop it. Did you hear the change in the tone of the horn as it went by? You don't know. Now watch where the, the lead engine is. That's where the engineer is going and, and blowing the horn from the lead engine. As the lead engine passes by the guy with the camera, listen to the change in the tone. All right? Let's try it again. It's right at about 44 seconds. Stop. What happens to the tone of the horn or the pitch? It, yeah, it goes down. So make a note of that. The train horn, after it passes you by... The pitch goes down. And by the same token, as it's approaching you, you don't know this, but if, if you were able to stand next to that train in the freight yard when the train was at rest, zero miles per hour, you would realize that as the train is approaching, its pitch is higher than normal. So... Okay, thanks. Switch back to... So let's talk about that. That's the Doppler effect. Okay, and make here you can jot down the, the address there. Um, the Doppler effect is a change in pitch, if it's sound, uh, or a change in frequency in general. Um, because of motion between the source, the train horn, the lead engine, and the observer. That's the guy with the video camera. All right. And here's another example. You may have heard it. If, if you're ever at home and you hear an ambulance or a fire truck go by, you sometimes, you know, it'll stir up all the dogs in the neighborhoods. But as it goes by your house or by your car, if you're out on the highway, you'll hear the pitch go down. As it, as it passes you, all right? Um, so if, if you're in the train yard, in the freight yard, and you're talking to the engineer, and he's not going anywhere, and you say, let me, let me hear that, that, that horn, uh, he'll blow the horn, and it'll be a certain frequency, for instance, 113.2 hertz, Okay. If the source is moving towards you, the frequency increases. So it will be a higher pitch. And that is what we saw um, unbeknownst to you uh, on the video. So it might be 115 hertz. Okay. It's still pretty low. But it's a little bit higher than the frequency when you and the source are at rest relative to each other. By the same token, when it moves past you, it definitely dips to a sh smaller, a lower pitch. Same basic uh, loudness level. When it's close, it's loud. When it's far away, it's, it's not so loud. But the pitch is definitely less. Okay, and that's, and we did observe that directly uh, in the video. It went from a high pitch, and as it passed by the cameraman, it dipped to a lower pitch. All right. Now, the radar gun 
observes the same thing. But with the radar gun, it's electromagnetic waves, not sound waves, like that thing in, uh, in YouTube. So if you want to make a side note, type in the word rail fan, uh, all one word, rail fan or rail fanning, um, in YouTube, uh, and you get zillions zil of these. But then you got to listen to see if, if any of them have good Doppler effects. And it'll take you just a few minutes to find good ones. This, this one took me like about 30 seconds the first time I tried it. But there's zillions of them in there. Now, let's work out the the process. Let's keep going. Now the radar gun knows this fancy relativity formula over here. So you can go ahead and write this down. It's a, the ratio of the return frequency that bounces off your car and the sending frequency that the police officer shoots at your car is equal to this big square root. And inside the square root is a quotient of two mixed fractions. One plus uh, v over C and 1 minus V over C in the denominator. V is the speed of the car and C is the speed of light. So the radar gun catches the return uh, frequency. All right. And it knows the sending frequency. That's set at the factory. You know, whatever, you know, whatever they have it set at, you know, like one gigahertz or something like that. Okay. They also, in, in the little computer built into the radar gun, they know the speed of light. 299, 792, 458 meters per second. 299,792,458 meters per second. All right, so that's all programmed in. And because that is the case, the computer then solves for V. V is the speed of your vehicle. Now, it's kind of tricky looking here. There's a lot of calculus, or not calculus, there's a lot of algebra. If you feel like tackling it, yeah, you can solve for, for V by squaring both sides and then, you know, getting V by itself and, you know, taking a little bit of algebra. We're not going to do that, but I do want you to see the formula uh, based on the theory of relativity that the radar gun uses. So that allows you to solve for V. So for instance, if the radar gun has a factory setting of 100 gigs, and you know, I tried to look up the frequency of radar guns, and I, on, you know, like on Google, I was not able to do that. So I'm just making this up. I have no idea what frequency. There's probably a reason they don't publicize what the frequency is, so it can't be defeated. Anyway, so let's say it has a nice round frequency, 100 gigahertz. And if that is the frequency, then its wavelength is uh, 0.003 meters, 3 millimeters. That's a, that's a radar frequency and a radar wavelength. Now, let's say that what, what the radar gun actually does is it, it measures the beats, the beat frequency. So let's say that it measures 26, 685.132 hertz. Whoa. That is eight significant figures. And we've got goods that can do that. We've got electronics that can easily do that. Easy as walking through the park. And then it says, all right, if that's the case, then my return frequency is just uh, 100 gigs plus that. And so it amounts to this big ginormous number here one and then a bunch of zeros and then two six six eight five point one three two hertz all right now go ahead and write down all those digits and stuff and then think okay i'm gonna let the computer do the talking the computer can take that number and easily calculate the speed and if they do it comes in at 89.5 miles per hour now, I'm not going to point at anybody. I'm not going to look at anybody. But whoever does uh, generate that kind of a Doppler shift, uh, they are busted. Now, let me point something out to you. This is phenomenal accuracy. It's 267 parts per billion. Whoa.
dude. We can easily do that with electronics. We've got good electronics. They can, they can hack that apart. So don't even bother arguing with the cops. They know your speed pretty well. Now, the only way to defeat a cop is if he's off to the side somewhere and he's measuring you from a slant. And that's why they sit in the middle of the highway, you know, in the median where you're not expecting him or right along the side where they can get you as you come around a turn. And uh, I just got a speeding ticket last week, so I'm a bad boy. 166 bucks. All right. Now, here's one more thing I'd like to point out to you, Evangeline. That is, they can get you if you're moving away from them, too. This frequency coming at you is a little bit higher than 100 gigs. All right? But they would get the same beat frequency if you were moving away from the police vehicle. And then you'd have that many uh, hertzes below 100 gigs. So that you, they'd say, all right, his frequency, his return frequency is a little bit below. And they could still nab you. If you're, if you're moving at 89.5 miles per hour away from the cop car, ding, they got you for that too. So that's why I say they measure the beats, and then they figure out what the relative speed is away from you or toward you, it doesn't matter, you're, you're busted. Now, you still have a question? Yeah, go ahead. How did I get to what? Uh, yeah, that's the ratio between 89.5 and the speed of light. So it's, it's pretty impressive. All right. Anyways, let's do a, some clicker questions. Go ahead and get your clicker started, please. And your first clicker question is about the cops. And this is an academic exercise because I know you are all nice citizens, young men and young ladies that never break the speed law. Although I know that there are some bad people at UCF that do. I see it all the time out on University uh, Boulevard, heading away from UCF at about 3 or 4 in the afternoon when all the crazy drivers are out there, but I know it's nobody in here. But go ahead and answer this question. Outgoing 1.005, return frequency 1.007 gigs. Let's see this distribution. All right, 15 seconds. <clears throat> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay. Uh, yeah, most of you answered that correct. If the... If the frequency is increasing, you know, here's one way you can think of it kind of in, in pictures. The wavefronts of the return signal are getting put. The, the, the source is coming at you, so the wavefronts of the return signal are getting squeezed between you and the source. Okay, a lot of people think of it that way. All right. Question number two, hit the refresh button on your calculator and try this numeric question. Okay, so go to numeric. Okay. All right. Compute the B frequency for radar. Same 
Outgoing is 1.005 gigahertz. Return is 1.007 gigahertz. Type your answer to the nearest megahertz. Can you make that window a little bit wider? The, the mortal struggle of correct versus incorrect. Thirty seconds. Hey, finally it's in the. This is the struggle of Batman versus Superman. That movie sucked. Yeah, I heard. I didn't it's, see it. I don't buy that whole thing of Batman versus Superman. That's bogus. Yeah. Like Superman is some kind of, you know, evil. Yeah. No. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Go ahead. Uh, answer two megahertz, and for those of you, twenty-six percent of you had that correct. A bunch of you typed in, another 18% of you typed in 0 0.002. That's in gigahertz. So here's, for those of you that got caught napping, this is most of you, here's the difference, 0 0.002 gigahertz. And a gigahertz is the same as 10 to the 9 hertzes. 10 to the 9 is the same as 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 6. So this is really 0 0.002 times 10 of the 3 times 10 of the 6 hertzes. Now, 10 of the 6 hertzes is a megahertz. All right, so that's down here. And then 0 0.02, excuse me, 0 0.002 times 10 of the 3, I put that in parentheses here. That's 0 0.002 times 1,000. That's just 2. So there's your answer. Right? Questions about that? Kayla. That is the difference. The B frequency is the difference between F1 and F2. So it's 2. It's 0 0.002 gigahertz. Uh, where did I get the 10 to the 9? A gig is the capital G is the symbol for gigahertz, and giga, giga anything means 10 to the ninth of them, 10 to the ninth power, a billion. All right. You can look it up. I think it's in the appendix of our textbook. No different. Another question. All right, let me keep going. Question number three, fundamental frequency. And hit the refresh key again. This is multiple choice. What's the second harmonic? C sharp 278.
Give me this. What is that? Oh, that's it doing. It did that last time. Yeah, I know. Go ahead and close that bar chart. Open it. Yeah. That is weird. Go ahead and close it. We don't really need to. Uh, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, off the bar chart. That is weird. Uh, five, five, six. Yeah, it's double. It's double the uh, fundamental. Second harmonic is double. All right, let's keep going. Energy of, of waves. Now, the intensity of a wave is really, you know, the loudness. That's really the amount of energy pouring through a certain surface area, either imaginary or physical, uh, per second. So f for you, your primary sound probes are your eardrums, all right? So the amount of sound energy, the, the amount of uh, watts per square meter or per square centimeter is the is how you'd, how, how you'd figure out numerically the intensity, all right? Now, it's it's actually proportional to the square of the amplitude, all right? And this is another one where it's important, the fact that the intensity is proportional to a squared. And there's a bunch of other constants, you know, that I'm not going to mention. It's kind of tricky to do. But, yeah, a squared, the square of the amplitude is in there. So the bigger the speaker, the more uh, loudness you have. So here, here's some earbuds. Now compare that to this speaker, you know, which is ginormous. Um, and that big speaker is going to put out a lot more loudness, you know. Whereas if your earbuds are right there in your eardrum, you don't really need a lot of loudness. You need something, but not a whole lot. So now here's some examples. Um, and you've heard of this uh, concept, decibels of sound. Okay, a decibel is a, a generic term. In terms of sound, what it means, uh, zero decibels, the threshold of human hearing, uh, for most people that don't have eagle eye, uh, not eagle eyes, uh, supersonic hearing like Superman, uh, it's uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. Now that might sound like a small number, 10 to the minus 12. That is a small number, but your eardrums are definitely not a square meter. You know, your eardrums are maybe a few square millimeters. And so a square millimeter is a millionth um, of a square meter. So it's, you know, so you're, you're getting a good number of watts per in your eardrum. 10 decibels is 10 to the minus 11, 1 times 10 to the minus 11 watts per square meter. 20 decibels, 1 times 10 to the minus 10. And 20 decibels is commonly thought to be about the sound of a whisper without a microphone. So here's me whispering into the microphone. Did you hear that? If you didn't, if if you if if I wasn't mic, I'll, I'll turn off my mic. See if you can hear it. 20 decibels. The answer to the next question is. Did you hear? See, they can hear me up here in the front row. The guys in the back row didn't hear that. So let me turn the mic back on. All right. Come on, Mike. All right, here we go. Uh, heavy traffic, 70 decibels. 1 times 10 to the 5, excuse me, 1 times 10 to the minus 5 watts per square meter. Now, the sun 
in terms of radiant energy, we don't read the sun in terms of decibels, but it's putting 1,361 watts per square meter uh, facing the surface of the uh, sun. Uh, so that's a lot more intensity from solar radiation. But this is this is talking sound now. Here's a table, uh, and you can look up these tables of decibels and stuff. Uh, the, the cool one is down here. A jet, 200 feet away from a jet, uh, would be 120 decibels, and that's one watt per square meter, which in terms of solar energy is not much. We'd have to be way far away from the, from the sun to get that many watts per square meter from the s solar energy. But for sound energy, yeah, you're talking damage. That's why those guys at the airport wear those big uh, headphones to protect their hearing. Here's another listing. And I made this a little bit bigger so you can see the exponent. Threshold of human hearing, 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. If you go up by 10 decibels then the exponent goes from minus 12 up to minus 11, all right? So, the, so more decibels means a smaller uh, exponent. 20 decibels, you go up by another power of 10. So now you go from 10 to the minus 12 all the way up to 10 to the minus 10, all right? The whisper. Uh, and then here's heavy traffic again. Seven, and, you know, there's you could put dot, dot, dot between uh, all of these, really. And to figure out, you know, the exact decibel rating for something, you have to measure the sound energy. And you got to use a lot of logarithms and stuff. Uh, but these are, the, these are the ones that are easy. Because whatever you see, um, the quantity varying as the exponent like that, it means that there's logarithms involved. And we're not supposed to be doing logarithms in here. Anyways, that's the decibel. It's a snapshot or a little sneak peek of the decibel system in terms of sound. Now, um, electricians and electrical engineers, they use decibels for, for measuring electrical signals uh, as well. So it's, it's, decibels is not just used for sound, but it's commonly used for sound. So any questions about this? Okay, look at this. Hey, you guys back there, you looking? You all looking? Yo, in the back with your phone. Yeah, take a look. Can you read that? What is that? It's German. That's Einstein's original paper on the theory of relativity. I know a German, zur Elektrodynamik. Bewegter Körper. That means, in English, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. And that was his very first paper, June 30th, 1905, about the theory of relativity. So let's take a look at electro electrodynamics. And here's kind of a cute picture of an electromagnetic interaction that we know colloquially as static clean. This little baby's got a lot of static claims <laughs> messing around in the laundry hamper. But it's, it's actually something that we've been trying to grapple with uh, carefully for the past 2,000 change years. Uh, the... You know, this static cling, the fancy name for it is tribal electricity. In other words, you rub stuff together and you develop an electrical interaction between the two substances. Like this lady combing her hair, uh, there's a net charge uh, on the comb and there's a net charge in her hair and it causes her hair to cling and fuzz out and stuff like that. The name tribal electricity is from the Latin word tribulum, which means to... Uh, which is the word for a threshing sled uh, and also the word uh, tribulation. So a threshing sled is something that uh, they use to process 
grain and separate the, the stalks from the actual grains of wheat. And he's, they call it a threshing sled. Um, the famous example from history is they found this to be an effect for um, fossilized amber. So we've been, you know, we've been looking at, at amber for thousands of years as because it's a beautiful gemstone. It's fossilized pitch from certain pine trees. And it has the property that if you rub it, it'll stick to stuff or stuff will stick to it. Little threads, little pieces of papyrus and stuff like that. The, the Greek word for amber is electron. And that is why we use the word today, electron and electronics, electromagnetism, electric, electricity, for electricity. Now, the tribal electric series, you can jot down a few of these, I guess. Um, rubbing human hands together with Teflon uh, or rubbing uh, glass with... Uh, uh, saran wrap, glass with rubber, uh, that will produce a net electric charge. So back in the days of Ben Franklin, you know, people were trying to figure out this tribal electric series, you know, and try to quantify the electromagnetic interaction. Ben Franklin is the one that decided that the stuff on one end is the stuff that is very positive, and the stuff at the other end, at the bottom, is very negative. So rubber, he decided, would be uh, the charge it acquired would be considered negative. And we've just gone with that decision ever since, the, the decision of Ben Franklin. And that is why electrons are now considered to be negative particles and protons are considered to be positive particles. Could it, if Ben Franklin had gotten out of the bed on the other side of the bed that day, we would have positive electrons and negative protons. But this is what we've got. Another guy prominent in the theory of electromagnetic interaction is Michael Faraday. And he's the person in the early 1800s, very interesting guy, uh, that discovered the principle of electromagnetic induction. In other words, a changing magnetic field can generate an electric field. That is how we generate electricity to this day. The generator, the dynamo, was invented by Michael Faraday. He discovered all the effects for that back in around 1830. And he was a very famous guy in his day. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because he was a lot like you guys. He didn't have any calculus and probably not much trig. You know, he, he probably knew Pythagorean theorem. But he became the most famous physicist in the world. And he's... He, even though he didn't use mathematical tools, he was able to think. And he did all kinds of observations in the lab, all kinds of measurements, and he thought about it. And he came up with the whole idea of the electromagnetic field that we still use to this day. As a matter of fact, the next guy to make a, a similarly large development uh, was Albert Einstein with the development of the theory of relativity. In between those two guys, here's another guy uh, with a big, huge beard, James Clark Maxwell. And he was the one that unified the magnetic and the electric field, theoretically. So what, what Maxwell did mathematically, he, he deduced or figured out the mathematical structure of the electric and the magnetic fields and figured out Whoa, they're not separate things. Magnets aren't different fundamentally from, char uh, from electric currents. They're both part of the same electromagnetic field. Right? And here's a famous quote from him. Mathematicians may flatter themselves that they possess new ideas, which mere human language is as yet unable to express. In other words, equations. Let them make the effort to express the, uh, these ideas in appropriate words without the aid of symbols. Boy, he's, he's really blazing up the math department. And if they succeed, they will not only lay us laymen under a lasting obligation, but we venture to say they will find themselves very much enlightened during the process. Ooh, that's, he, he, he just gave them a left-handed compliment. In other words, he, he told them, 
the math department, you're a bunch of nimrods. And they will eventually be doubt, and, and will even be doubtful whether the ideas as expressed in symbols had ever quite found their way out of the equations and into their minds. You know, and if, if he were living today, he would say, into their so-called minds. And he was an interesting guy from Scotland. And he, uh, when Michael Faraday was an old man, uh, James Clerk Maxwell was a young man. And so they kind of followed. And he, this guy knew uh, calculus out the wazoo. And so he made his electromagnetic uh, field equations, the Maxwell field equations, uh, are a huge topic of study to this day. All right, the next guy we're going to talk about is J.J. Thompson in 1896. Now, he was experimenting with something called cathode rays, which, you know, they, they set up um, either um, an electric current, an alternating current, or a direct current uh, to a metal plate, and they found that under certain conditions it would emit these cathode rays. And there's a picture of his device or a sketch of it down below there. Um, he, what he did was he used parallel metal plates, one of them positive and one of them negative, and he figured that these cathode rays were actually particles that were possibly positive or possibly negative. And so he said, let me send them between two parallel metal plates and see how they respond. And what he found was that the cathode ray was actually negatively charged. Negatively in the sense that Ben Franklin began. And he found that they have a precise ratio of mass to charge. So he figured out, boy, these things are really small and they have negative charge. Now here's his device. That letter C, you might not be able to see it from the back, but on YouTube you'll be able to see it. The letter C, that's the cathode, that's where the rays are generated. Then it goes through this gooseneck here, and it gets narrowed down to a beam and also accelerated to high speed. And then it goes between the two plates here, the two horizontal plates, and hopefully it gets deflected either up or down. And this round um, area here at the end of the diagram, kind of the globe at the end on the right side, that was painted with phosphorescent paint. So when the electrons hit that, it glowed. All right. So here's, here's a, a, a little bit bigger picture. You can see what this looks like. So he sent the cathode rays in between the positive and the negative plates. And he said, if they're negative, they'll be deflected upward towards the positive plate. If they're negative, they'll be attracted downward Excuse me. Um, if, if the cathode rays are negative, they'll be deflected away from negative towards positive. In other words, upward. If the cathode rays are positive, they'll be deflected away from positive toward the negative. In other words, downward. And this is what he found. That he sent them into the detector. That's this little sliver over here. It's supposed to be a sliver of glass. And it plows into that. Uh, phosphorescent paint and causes it to glow. And when he saw that, he knew that electrons were negative. This is the same technology that is used in the old time TV sets that you still see around in different... I actually have one in my office. Uh, and CRT, computer displays like this one, which you still see some places. We're going to all flat screen now, but uh, not too long ago, people used this steerable beam of electrons inside of a TV tube. Uh, and that's why TVs were so big. Now, we use different technology for flat screens. Here's another picture of his device. So make a note, this is what Thompson's idea was. He said, you know, these, these electrons are negative, so I think that an atom, they knew that atoms tended to be neutral. You could ionize them and knock it knock an electron off or add an electron in, then it would be negative. If you knock one off, it would be a positive ion. But he said, you know, we got these atoms, they, they, they like to be neutral. 
The, the electrons are negative, so there must be a positive kind of a blob of smushed together positive stuff. You know, like uh, you know, like that 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 goop that you make in in elementary school science projects. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever made that kind of goop in a elementary. Oh man, hardly anybody. But anyways, there's this stuff. That you, I don't even, I don't even remember what you make it with. I've never made it. I've only seen people make it. But anyway, it's some kind of blob of stuff. But it, it turns out that it's not. That the atom is not kind of this blob of positive stuff with little teeny um, discrete particles of electrons uh, smooshed together in there. And the guy that figured this out was is known as Ernest Rutherford. Very famous guy. So J.J. Thompson and Ernest Ruth. J.J. Thompson was a little bit older than Ernest Rutherford, and they both worked in England. And what Rutherford did was he took this other species of particles known as alpha particles or alpha rays. And the, these things could be observed from radioactive substances in three different waves, alpha rays, beta rays, or cathode rays, and then uh, gamma rays. And we still use the terminology gamma rays for gamma radiation. But he took this source, you know, like a piece of radium or something, and aimed the alpha particles at a thin fold, uh, a, a very thin gold foil, and smashed those alpha particles into the gold foil. Now, the interesting thing about gold is, uh, and you can make a note of this, gold has the property that it can be pounded into very thin sheets, so thin that it is gold, it looks like gold, but light can go through it, still hold together as a sheet. It's not very stout, it's not very strong, but yeah, they can pound it that thin. So he took a, th a thin f gold foil and he set up this device. All right, now try to make a sketch of this. Here's this target in the middle. This is the gold sheet, the gold foil. All right. Here's this source of alpha particles inside this kind of grayish box down here. So this might be a chunk of radium or something like that, which we still have today. I mean, it's an element. It's, it's kind of hard to find, but you, you know, we can we can refine it from certain kinds of rocks and stuff. And then he sends he sends it. Uh, out, it's 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 in a lead-lined box, so the alpha particles can't get out of the box except through a very small slit, and the stuff that goes out through this very small opening hits the foil. Now, when it hits the foil, whatever it is, it ricochets into different directions, all right? And then it then he set up a detector all around it to measure the effect um, by phosphorescence of these alpha impacts, right? And he could measure the angle at which they got deflected. So they'd come straight in, and then some of them, like these over here, would buzz right through or pretty close to right through without change. Most of them did that. But some of them dipped over here to the side. Some of them dipped over. Some of them went straight across. They took. They went and they took a left turn or a right turn. But here's the killer right here, this one. This one that not just turns left, it turns left and keeps going and goes back towards the, a little bit towards the source. That is known as backscattering. Write that word down, backscattering. Because that means you, whatever the alpha particle is, it is getting electromagnetic repulsion. They knew that the alpha particle was positive. And so when they saw backscattering, they knew that they had a positively charged something. And the gold foil was so thin that the alpha particles were only interacting with one or maybe two. So when you saw one of them bounce back the other way, you knew it was interacting with an atom. And 
This is what they expected. They expected, okay, if J.J. Thompson was right, the, the alpha particles would just kind of stream through there and just kind of blaze on through. But what they observed was this. And so here's backscattering. This is what they figured must be happening. That inside the atom, there's a small positive nugget that causes backscattering. And they named that the nucleus. So that Rutherford is the one that figured out that there is a nucleus. And its particles, the nucleus is positive because it causes positive alphas to backscatter. So Rutherford's famous. And physics grad students the world over repeat Rutherford's experiment when they're grad students or sometimes when they're undergrads. It's a famous, famous experiment. It's kind of tough to do, but it's worth doing. Because it's the one, that, this is the experiment and the observations that prove that atoms have an incredibly small nucleus and that it's positive. And then that made things, that made sense because now you know what electrons are doing. Because we know that electrons are negatory. So they figured out. All right, we've got neutrons and protons in the nucleus. By 1932, they had discovered the neutron as well, and they knew that it was in the nucleus. And so now we draw the nucleus as kind of like a kind of an uh, oddly shaped bag of positives and neutrals, neutrons and protons. And then Rutherford said, "Yeah, we got that." And then we got these electrons buzzing around in orbit around. The nucleus. All right, so Rutherford, his model of the atom was not the blob model of J.J. Thompson, or as they say in England, the Christmas, the plum pudding model. That's what J.J. Thompson thought of it. You know, I guess there's this thing in England called plum pudding, which if you have it, it's got raisins in it. And so J.J. Thompson must have really loved plum pudding. But if you're from the Caribbean, they have stuff called black cake that they make at Christmas time. It's really delicious, and I believe that they put uh, raisins in it. But the J.J. Thompson to me is just kind of a smush of positive stuff with little raisin, or little, there I go, raisins, raisinettes, with little negative electrons embedded in it. But Rutherford figured this out. This is the basic model. And it's kind of encoded in the in the data that you see in each tile of the periodic table. So um, go ahead and make a note of that. And what we're going to do now, I have a mental IQ test question for you. Now I want you to think. And talk to your neighbors and talk it over. And this is, hit the refresh key on your calculator and go ahead and start. Thank you. And just jot down this question and the answers in your notes. Because this is actually, this is a question that the guys in the days of Rutherford had to grapple with. If like charges repel, then what keeps a nucleus of protons and neutrons together? Go ahead and vote. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ching. Okay. Uh, and you guys can't see this, but 31% of you voted for A, 
18 voted for 18 percent voted for B 36 voted for 36 percent voted for C and 15 percent voted for D and this is actually the correct answer so those of you that raise your hand if you voted for C you just discovered the third law of nature, the third force of nature, the strong nuclear interaction. Go ahead and write that down. The positive nucleus is the first sign that there is a third law, a third force in nature, and it is called, we now call it the strong nuclear interaction. And you guys just deduced it. Now, the rest of you guys, you didn't deduce it, but now you've learned about it. Now, next time we're going to talk about Professor Coulomb. Go ahead and read in chapter, I don't know, I think it's chapter 8. I gave you page references. There will be some homework tonight. Uh, you're dismissed. I'll see you on Tuesday next week.